uh, overflowing creative juices in this room, ladies and gentlemen. I have to say, it will be hard a little bit to contain that enthusiasm, I understand that, but we'll do the very best we can. Uh, my name's Jeff McDonald, it is my, indeed my great pleasure, and I have to say, real honour, to have been asked by, by the two ladies, Tan and Ali, to MC uh, this morning, and work all the way through to Q&A, which I have to say, I'm exceedingly excited about. Um, because uh, I'd just like to hear uh, the, the questions that come from the floor. Um, it's uh, probably the first visit, I would say, and maybe Sue can uh, attest to this, probably the first visit from uh, anyone from New York in the highest of steam in the calibre of arts and culture that we've had visit Toowoomba. <laughs> It is extra special, extra special. And the fact that you bypass Melbourne to be here. You <laughs> 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 fly direct into Brisbane West World Camp, straight to Melbourne, and return. Okay, we won't give you a bit too long. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are a number of people to acknowledge, and I'll do that shortly, but I'd first uh, like to acknowledge uh, country, if I could, ladies and gentlemen, with your indulgence. Uh, and it's important that we do this. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we gather today, the Jibal and Gerald people, and pay uh, my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal Australia, the world's oldest living culture. I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people continue to live in spiritual and sacred relationships with this country. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a number of people, <coughs> and by no means fit, don't feel left out if I don't mention you, OK? But there is a reasonable, reasonable amount of people. Uh, can I start, ladies and gentlemen, by acknowledge the federal member for Groom, the Honourable Dr John McVeigh. <laughs> this could go till 11.30 if we can give everyone a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if we just keep the, the applause to just, to, just a couple yeah, of claps. Yeah. Just two. <laughs> okay, we all agree, just two claps. Okay. Those in favour. <laughs> State member for, uh, for Toowoomba uh, South, David Janeski. Uh, <laughs> Some went in day three there. Eh? <laughs> Some went none at all. <laughs> I appreciate it. Less, less, is, less is better on this occasion. Can I acknowledge my fellow councillor, colleague, councillor Nancy Summerfield? Excellent. This is working well. Um, to our very, very special guest, I alluded to it earlier, uh, very special guest indeed. To Sharon Loudon in the front here, Sharon. Uh, the artist as culture producer, living and sustaining a creative life. One of the longest titles for a book I've ever <laughs> heard, but I'm looking forward to hearing more about it, Sharon. Uh, from Hyperallergic, ladies and gentlemen, the person who wrote forward in the book, Parag Vartanian. Parag is conspicuous by his yellow Dunlop volleys. Yeah, yeah, red, red, red. Oh my god, red Dunlop volleys. They are wearing their Tuomba Violet pins already. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you. Two claps, thank you. This is fantastic. And so I wish this worked like this at council. It would be a hell of a lot better, wouldn't it? Uh, from Arts Hub in Sydney, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Gina Fairley, who is uh, writing about the book. Uh, there's, a, a, there's a couple of travelling companions as well, ladies and gentlemen. We have Vincent, who's over here on the camera. That was more than two claps, man. <laughs> I, under I understand if you don't. There's no favouritism in this room. Okay, let's keep it two claps. All right. Um, and also, uh, Vegan, is that right? Oh, oh Vegan. Vegan, welcome to you as well. All the way from New York via Sydney and other places, and heading to Brisbane and then to Alice and then to Hobart, as I understand. Um, so you'll be tired by the end of Vegan. Okay. As I said, our room is overflowing with. Creative juices, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I could acknowledge everyone individually, but I'd, I'd like to acknowledge just a couple of people if, if I could. Uh, Jennifer Wright Summers. Um, Jennifer, lovely to see you here from the Arts Council. Two claps. Very well done. 
work some stuck in three. I saw you in three there. I saw that. Uh, and uh, Associate Professor Janet McDonald from the University. Lovely to have you here. Uh, there are, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, council representatives here as well, uh, not only councillors, but we do have uh, a lady who's well known to all of you. Uh, she is indeed the Regional Coordinator for Art Galleries and Cultural Services, and in fact, out of her own pocket, has paid for the hire of the venue uh, through her support for community and regional arts, Sue Lostrover. <laughs> through that as, as best I can. Uh, can we now thank the, uh, the funders of this project, Ford Foundation yes. from USA, and down the link, thank you, Ford Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. Uh, National Association of Visual Arts, or as we refer to as NAVA. NAVA. Thank you very much indeed, NAVA. <laughs> there we go. Two claps. And a very special thank you, and you can extend that applause well and truly over two for this if you prefer, uh, to Graham Kelly. The, the, uh, yeah, Ray Gunner, an official at uh, Ray Gunner. Uh, so, uh, good on you. Uh, well done. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, can we, can we reserve the biggest round of applause to the two ladies who I'm sure none of this would have happened without them, uh, to Ali and Tan. It's exhausting. <laughs> Sharon's got a plan in the right arm. She's going to straighten the left arm. It's been absolutely marvellous. Well done. Thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen. To, uh, to officially welcome uh, uh, our visitors uh, from afield, can you please welcome the Honourable Dr John McVeigh. Uh, Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, in uh, thanking Jeff for that introduction, we should give him one clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor McDonald. Uh, and I certainly, certainly want to uh, thank you, as I said, for that introduction uh, and welcoming us all here today. Uh, and uh, like you, uh, I acknowledge uh, our elders. I thank you for that welcome uh, to country. Yeah. And of course, uh, I acknowledge my uh, representative colleagues, Councillor Nancy Summerfield, as well, from the Trumbull Regional Council, alongside Councillor Jeff McDonald, uh, and uh, David Janetsky, the state member for Toowoomba South. Uh, and I guess it's my um, short but very pleasant uh, duty and honour to, I guess, officially welcome uh, both Sharon Bragg uh, here uh, and uh, very much looking forward to your presentation, the launch of this book. Uh, Jeff has uh, provided us with some background uh, already and uh, the number of people that uh, you've attracted here uh, this morning, the number of people you've uh, uh, brought along with you as well. Uh, so uh, I won't go back through all of that. But I did just want to make a couple of observations. Uh, and it's been um, uh, an interesting week, I think, here in Toowoomba from a, from a visual arts perspective, from a culture perspective in terms of... Uh, the Twilight Tour that we had just the other night here at our, our Toowoomba Regional Art Gallery, uh, considering uh, that uh, uh, that was only a few days ago when we, when we um, uh, had a tour of some of the works of uh, the late Dr Irene Amos, um, uh, an educator, uh, an artist, uh, a mentor, um, I think uh, for uh, Tarn amongst other people. Where's Tarn? Uh, uh, as I heard the other night. Uh, and we uh, had the theme there of the fabric of things unseen at that, uh, that particular Twilight tour. What did I take from that um, as one who was fortunate enough to get along and attend uh, and to listen to the presentation from Sue uh, and Sandy? Um, uh, it was really interesting to learn about Irene's interpretation of a whole range of things, and in this case, in line with that theme of the fabric of things unseen, for example, a couple of works that were her interpretation of the sound of birds in a rainforest, which I found just fascinating. 
Uh, and uh, we heard her about her life story the other night and her contribution uh, to uh, to the communities, the art communities, the the regional communities in which she uh, lived and worked, Brisbane, here, uh, in Toowoomba, where she's a great contributor, of course, including uh, to our to our Toowoomba Regional Art Gallery. So it got me thinking about the contribution of people like that to our community, and I think um, that was a, an excellent forerunner, if you like, um, to this discussion today. Uh, the artist as culture producer, living and sustaining a creative life. Uh, and I think uh, some of the words there include um, how uh, the sharing and stepping out of the studio into the community and providing education and direction and a whole range of things, which no doubt uh, Sharon and Harag will talk to us about this morning. It makes me think, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, someone together with my <coughs> colleagues that I've mentioned and others in this region representing our region um, in the three levels of government, that uh, particularly at a state and federal level, given that what we do is give local government lots of money and then we get on with the work, uh, is, is that uh, we uh, have a focus, amongst other things, at present on STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths and education uh, around those topics, particularly our young people and encouraging industry development around that. Well, as many of you would know, that, uh, that terminology has been uh, extended to STEAM, so we're including arts along science, technology, and yeah. That is something I think that is uh, very important, uh, and I think that's the sort of theme that I'm hoping I pick up on uh, today as we uh, listen to Sharon and Harag. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome, uh, and very much looking forward to uh, hearing from you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you go. Full head of steam and everything's happening. Right? That's excellent. Uh, Isn't that great news? Yes. Right? That's, that's, uh, in, in fact, that's breaking news. Isn't it? Yes. Or no? That's breaking news. Someone said yes. More than two claps for John. Yes. <laughs> you see how I'm a comrade? Well, we got one clap. Yeah, we got one. That's, right. that's okay. Keep giving us plenty of money too. I'll be checking it. Right? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Nancy. You'll be following that up as well, which is fantastic. And Sue, you'll be doing the same, won't you? Exactly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the time we've all been waiting for. I'm really excited to uh, not only listen to uh, to both of these amazing people, uh, but also how they're going to launch the book um, with fanfare. Uh, so Sharon has assured me that Harag is definitely in line for that sort of fanfare, and I'm not sure <laughs> what that means. But ladies and gentlemen, can you please give more than one clap, more than two clap, give them a shout, give them a cheer. Sharon and Harag. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that down the lane? <laughs> do I have to do that? I'm very, I'm very loud though. Sir, I had no idea this was going to be a performance. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Honey, okay, so am I supposed to hold this? Yes. It okay. looks good. It's not good. Uh, so it's so odd looking. It's very big. Well, it's being recorded. Oh, okay, that's it. Okay. So, uh, my, uh, my name is Sharon Lada, although some people have called me Shazza. <laughs> I forgot to mention that in Sydney, I should have mentioned that before. But, uh, so, as, as these fine gentlemen have said, that we are on this 95 stop book tour. So we're going to actually probably shorten this a bit and run through this presentation a little bit, but we want to give you some background as to why we're here today, and then we're going to talk about uh, some sustainable uh, models of how artists uh, sustain their creative lives. And the reason why we're doing this is we want to share this information that does come out of this book, but Tarn and Allie do this here, and I think that they're part of this, uh, shall I say, movement, although artists have been doing this for a long time, in being able to not only um, thrive under difficult situations, but create communities and grow and uh, uh, allow other people to thrive too from their creativity. So I'm just going to go through this. Oh, here's the remote. Let me see if I can do this well. 
Is that working? Yes. yes. So I'm just going to breeze through this really quick. So in 2011, I was approached to write a book, and instead of writing a book, I just said I would like to share stories of how artists sustain a creative life. So my first book was 40 artists um, just starting a conversation about how they sustain their creative lives today, like who they are as creative individuals. And that book went bananas. I mean, it's crazy. I, my, my husband and I edited that book. What we decided to do was we make it a shared project. All of the royalties from uh, both of my books are split with all the contributors. So this has never been about money. It's also uh, everybody gets their own copyright. In publishing, that does not happen. It's very rare. So I took this as an opportunity to create some new standards. And what happened with this book, it went on a 62-stop book tour. And then in addition to that, it's been sold in 18 countries, and it's in its seventh printing. It just happened a couple of weeks ago. So why was this so popular? And that picture right there with me laughing, that's actually one of my uh, contributors. Doesn't he look like he's going to kill me? <laughs> I love that picture he does. He's like, I'm going to kill you after this. Uh, I love that picture. But we went everywhere. And I think the reason why that book did so well is the general public wanted to really know who an artist is today. And I think also a lot of people who aren't artists want to know how to be creative too. How do they express themselves and their creativity within them? So here are some statistics from that tour. So I said 62 stops, um, and just gives you, we stayed within the United States for that tour because we started it with a, just a simple Kickstarter of $6,500 <clears throat> US dollars, and then we went on the road for 18 months. Wow. And it was just me and my husband. And actually, I experienced a house fire in New York City. So we, my husband and I were in limbo, and we were homeless for 229 days on that tour. So it was, it was actually fantastic, though. We got along really well. People were worried about that. <laughs> so on that tour, we met about 5,000 people on that tour, a lot of artists. And I learned a lot from a lot of the artists. And the artists that I met, um, they, some of them still thought that the way to be an artist was, was the myth of how Vincent Van Gogh lived. Okay, and I think the public still thinks of us artists as Vincent Van Gogh, but he died in 1890, and he didn't have a cell phone. You know, really different <laughs> world, right? So it didn't, it doesn't apply. Like we, we don't have paint in our hair. We can, I think we can. Uh, I'm not doing this very well right now, but speak in completed sentences. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're sort of normal. I don't think we're as eccentric as people think. So this time around, I wanted to do a book that highlighted people not only having a leg in the art world, because a lot of artists said to me, you can't show your work in galleries and museums and then do the other stuff, like have bridges to the public and be uh, out into the world and community. I said, hell yes, you can. So I wanted to satisfy everybody, but for the most part, the number one audience for this book is uh, the general public. It was very important to me. So uh, here are some just more statistics. So as I said, all the royalties uh, for my books are shared. That's how much money we've gotten every year. Ten dollars and four cents the first year. <laughs> how much that buys? It's like doesn't even buy, I mean it buys a really good bourbon. Okay. No, an, an average table bourbon on the rocks. That's all. <laughs> 26 cents the second year, $15.42, and then this year about $17. Um, but I'm hoping that will increase. Um, but we made this tour fully sustainable this time around. So this tour is 95 stops. So every stop that we're going to, we receive some kind of funding because I have to create a standard too that artists must be paid, just like anybody else in this world. We are substantive, we are integral in society. Not only do we c contribute to I'm going to talk to you too. Not only do we contribute to the, the economies, definitely creative economies, which is an engine towards the general economy. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. It's yeah. absolutely essential. <laughs> but more than that, I will say, not that you have to be convinced because you added that A, which is great, in, yeah. in yeah. to STEAM. When did that happen? Uh, today. Today? <laughs> Did it really happen today? That's been developing over the last 18 months. Really? Did it really happen today? 
It just no, no, no. No, no. Over the last 18 months or so. It, it did. Been. Wow. So then you know that not only do the arts contribute to the economy and an artist, we also contribute to the well-being of others. Mm -hmm. And that is the most important thing ab above all. Can you imagine if we didn't have movies or anything to look at or windows of imagination? We would all be at a loss. And also, it's a way for business people to think differently. They can think out of the box. Most entrepreneur entrepreneurs are creative. And where do they get that from? And artists are the leaders of those people. In addition, we can bounce back from failure like nobody else can. So we have models that we have within us to thrive. Now, if artists would just believe that too, that would be really helpful. Um, because sometimes <laughs> artists don't believe that they have the assets to go forward too. Okay, so in this tour so far, we've had, um, this was in Baltimore, the, basically they're town hall forums. I'm hoping this seems like it already is a town hall forum. Um, but basically we give a presentation and then the second half we have Q&A and answering questions and then also a big part of the tour is cross-pollination between different people in the audience but also ourselves and then the artists in the audience and connections that happen and impact after these events. Um, so that's in Cleveland, Ohio. This is at the Walker where we work together at, in Minneapolis. And so what we're going to do today is just talk about some issues that we see, but also some, like I said, some models of sustainability from some people, not necessarily, they're also in the book, but also outside, uh, not in the book too, just working as artists. So you want to start? Sure. So um, one of the things, I, I think we, we kind of created this slide so people kind of get a concept of where we're coming from and also why this is really important. And just in the United States alone, there are not roughly about 900 MFA programs. To kind of give you an eye, for those of you who may not have mastered <coughs> fine arts, so those are creating a lot of artists and designers and artistic individuals coming out. Of course, there are never enough galleries and, and museums to sort of contain the ambitions of these people, but that's all right, because artists know how to create <coughs> opportunities and to sort of create opportunities for themselves and others. So just to kind of give you a sense of how many students are coming out. So these are like, these are all about like learning about what other people are doing and sort of observing and watching. Now, of course, the loss of government funding is not something unique to uh, the United States. Of course, that's happening here. Um, but this is the sort of the, the realities that people are faced. The value of creativity, definitely in terms of even corporations are starting to see the value of what that means to have creative individuals. Because you know the quality of life is definitely impacted, particularly in cities and other settlements, by things like the arts. And of course, it attracts a lot of young professionals and other people, other people as well, which is really crucial. And of course, the lack of opportunities. Create your own. That is really, at the end of the day, the, the thing we need to do. Yep. OK, so we're going to focus on four different categories. So we're going to focus on artist-centered spaces, critical dialogue, institutions and their role, and strengthening community. And we put these websites up if you want to take some screenshots, so then you can look up these people afterwards if you have your iPhones and you can take them out, um, because there's no way that I can, we can both cover these people fully um, in this short presentation. Um, so two people I'll talk about, or three people, um, Sharon Butler and then Billy and Stephen Dufala, and um, these people are, are in my second book. I, I also want to just say something to um, what Harag just mentioned that about corporations, it's actually uh, one person in my second book, Brett Wallace, was hired by LinkedIn partially, actually I should ask him if it's just partially, I think it's entirely because he was an artist. Um, because now he manages 50 people, at least 50 people at LinkedIn to help them start up companies. And that's because he's an artist and has those <coughs> Uh, ways of thinking, but also in corporation, there's design thinking, which I know that has happened a lot here in Australia, and also um, um, in this region. Um, I think that that uh, corporations are becoming much more active. Okay, so Sharon Butler, Two Coats of Paint, she did this blog called Two Coats of Paint because she was stuck in a attic. It sounds like she's how am I going to say this? She was stuck isolated in an attic in Mystic, Connecticut. <laughs> she was probably losing her mind. I would, because it's such an isolated community there. Um, but I think she found that she wasn't getting discourse from this small community about painting. So what she did was she decided to 
uh, uh, create this blog called Two Coats of Paint that just talked about painting. And now it's an award-winning blog. And from that blog, she uses it as a platform for other opportunities. So what she has done, that's her in her studio in Brooklyn, laughing. <laughs> that's her talking. Uh, what she's done is that she has uh, many projects, but one thing is she gives her studio over to somebody who's not from New York. So everybody here could probably apply for her residency. You can look her up, Two Coats of Paint. Uh, dot com and she's on Twitter too at, at Two Coats and ask her about it but she gives her studio over for about a week every three months to somebody from out of town so they can showcase their work and then she advertises and publicizes that person on her blog which is super generous isn't that awesome and that creates opportunities but also opportunities for her to meet different people through that person so it's cross again cross cross pollinating communities she also created this thing called the $50 stock club where she got a bunch of artists together she advertised it again on her blog just as an idea said hey do a lot of people want to make money with me? How about if we all share, get together, and invest in stocks together? She got a bunch of artists to do that. Each person gave 50 bucks, and apparently they've been making a lot of money. They all chose together what stocks to invest in as a group. And then I think it's coming up to the end of that year, and then she's going to do another cycle, which is great. Uh, but she's somebody to really stay in touch with, and she's open and accessible, so I would recommend connecting with her. The other uh, person, uh, two people, I say person because I think of them as one, they're brothers. Billy and Stephen Jufala started a residency called the Recycled Artist in Residency in Philadelphia. They love working with rubbish or trash or what's normally viewed as that. They love that stuff. They think it's, well, obviously it's free and it's available. So they got together with the Department of Sanitation and said, hey, can we partner with you? Because we can get a lot of this stuff off your back and maybe we can create some residencies that is with the Department of Sanitation and have some artists on, on your, on your, um, at your facility. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. So they were actually loved it, and now they have this nonprofit organization. Not only do they have, I forgot to mention this, not only do they have residencies for artists, but they also have musical events, because they, they performed in a band for a long time. They have theater events. They've expanded to the whole arts community. Do you want to talk about sanitation? Yeah, we, well, the, one of the things that I think, one of the things about this uh, project that's interesting is this is becoming more of a trend in the US, where cities are actually embracing artists by creating artists in residence opportunities. So the New York City, for instance, has an artist in residence since the 1970s in the Department of Sanitation. The Department of Immigration in the city also has an artist in residence. Austin has created one, all these different cities, because they see the fact that a lot of the people in the departments want those artists there and the artists come up with creative ideas to bring in new voices to also create like sort of positive uh, you know interpretation bringing people to the sanitation department <laughs> oh, obviously it's going to be a um, but um, so that that's something that we're seeing more and more and of course artists love being embedded in the community in different kinds of ways I mean anytime I think that you bring artists to a company or to like a department of sanitation it changes the view of that department which is really good. We're going to talk about critical dialogue. We're talking about two people, Kara Ober, who started also another blog <coughs> called Be More Art, and Duncan McKenzie from Bad at Sports, which is a podcast program. Oh, I love how everybody's got their phones up. That's really good. I love that. Um, Kara saw a need in Baltimore. Has anybody ever been to Baltimore? Oh, you have. Oh, I got out of there fast. Oh. <laughs> well, I was just about to watch it how great Baltimore is. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot. I love your honesty. I think it's great. So Baltimore, oh thank you so much. Of course you take care of me like you do your whole community. Um, that's so wonderful. So Kara saw a need in Baltimore. I think the big thing for artists is that um, we have to get better in, in focusing on to not only our work, but how it may fill a need or what those needs are from others as a way of communicating to a public um, and speaking the same language. So Kara did just that. What she did was she saw a need to, to build up uh, and make known internationally what Baltimore has to offer. She's proud of her city and said, Damn it, I gotta get people here and I gotta pe get people to know what we have to offer. So she created this blog that 
uh, came about because she actually sought out funding herself. She went to different private foundations, and I know that that's not that's lacking here in this country is philanthropy, which I'm hoping that can be built up forward. I just keep looking at both of you. <laughs> um, but I think that that, I, I, we can help you with that too. But I think philanthropy is, is really important. I mean, I don't know all the ways in which, but we can at least share some models of how it works in the United States. But she met with some private family foundations and said, would you like to partner to bring up culture in Baltimore? And so what ended up happening was she got funding for this this blog, which turned then into podcasts, to events, and then to a print journal. And you can subscribe to Be More Art as well, and Two Coats of Paint for free, as well as Bad at Sports. Bad at Sports, funny picture, right? <laughs> so Duncan on the right hand side, he's the guy um, in the back, and Richard on the left. Duncan's in this book, he's hilarious, as you can see there, and his essay is really funny. He's very funny. Um, they're based in Chicago, and they were sort of tired of the fact that they weren't hearing enough of the voices of artists all over the world, outside of their community. So they just started saying, well, why don't we just interview them, record it, and share it with everybody else? They have no funding, zero. They do both work and have um, full-time employment. I think uh, just because you have a job doesn't make you any less of an artist, because they use their employment towards what they're doing here for Bad at Sports. And you can actually download, that. I think they have over 120 episodes or something like that. And you can download their episodes and listen to it for free. And, and they're very funny, and they, they're like, a, it's like a talk show. Did you say that, that you were interviewed first by Yeah, them? I mean, they, they, they really do a great job just reaching out to people. So people who, so it's not, it's easy to like write or talk to people who are just well known. You know, sort of, but they actually do the work, look out, look for people, often give them their first opportunities, and then when people start wondering, okay, who is this person, they listen to this, and all of a sudden, they go, okay, this person's normal, we could like talk to them, whatever, and then it leads to other opportunities. So it's their own time that is being put forward so that people can get to know these people that are still emerging. Yep. Europe. So the other thing, a lot, of, a lot of the questions we have is about institutions and their role because increasingly we see that art institutions are trying to sort of adapt and figure out what they're good at um, and also how to contain all the new work that's being made because artists of course are creating things that can't, that aren't always for, you know, the four white walls of a gallery. And so how does an institution continue to sort of keep up with the pace of creativity. Now I want to talk about two projects. One was Tanya Bruguera, who's a Cuban artist, an international project which she did with the Queens Museum in New York area. Now if you want to go to the next slide. So they did something unique in that they decided to work outside the museum. So what they did was rented a storefront that was for the local immigrant community, particularly the um, Hispanic community in their area of Queens. And these are women of different, as we, uh, various document, various immigration statuses that come to this place as a community hub that get together and figure out what they need. But this isn't a fishbowl. It's not like you can just show up to this place and just sort of as a reporter and say, I'm going to come and interview. They go, no, if you're going to come to this space, you have to participate. This is not a fishbowl. This is about you being part of a community. Either you're going to be a part of a community or not. So this project lasted for about five years under the artist's um, guidance. And then after five years, she was like, OK, you know what? I'm going to move on. And they decided, though, that the museum was going to continue this. So the museum continues to support this space. And only now, I think it's roughly in the eighth year, all of a sudden, these women have started feeling a sense of ownership. And particularly with the current political environment, they're sort of using it as a hub to organize, share information, you know, in a way that didn't exist. Economists to talk about the economics of you know, different industries. They're bringing in people to talk about you know, music from areas of the world that may not be familiar. They're bringing in people just to do film screenings for filmmakers who may not have access to theaters or other spaces or can't afford that. So this was a really important space that literally impacted thousands of people around the world through their programming. 
So another um, strengthening community. I think this is definitely a booming sort of part of the art world um, uh, in terms of because the community, because artists are wanting to get out of the, as, as Sharon said, in their sort of studios and other sort of traditional spaces. So we're going to talk about four, uh, three different spaces, one by Edgar Arsenault, who is a well-known artist based in Los Angeles. And he was working with the Watts House, pro House Project. And um, that project was first started by Rick Lowe, who's well known for the for the Houston Row Houses, which uh, won a MacArthur. He's one of the artists who won a MacArthur quote unquote genius grant years ago. Um, and he works with local real estate in underdeveloped areas, and then tries to work with the community to figure out what they need, and then bring an artist to create work and work with the communities there. In this case, they worked with Watts, which was a very poor area of South Central Los Angeles, and Edgar grew up in that area. But he, one of the interesting things about this essay is Edgar also talks about how artists have to navigate the world of nonprofits and understand what it is they're getting out of, of the different organizations, but also how they interact with the community. In this case, Edgar really loved the fact that they were cooperating and working with the community. But then eventually, he also had to admit the fact that nonprofits sometimes, you know, when they sort of run their course, also, it's all right for them to end. Not every project has to go on forever. Because eventually, after 10 years, they felt like they were the, the public were becoming clients of the organization. And that wasn't the relationship as an artist that he wanted. And that's one of the beautiful things about artists is because they really do scrutinize and sort of explore every single little relationship. And they look at that and then they decide when things start and when things end and what who's actually benefiting and how communities work together. Can I mention something about yeah. So Edgar has the longest essay in my second book, in this current book, that, which we're here for. And he is, uh, just like all the other artists in both of my books, and especially in the second one, big criteria for me in selecting those artists is they had to be generous and give to other artists. He is so generous. In addition to starting this project, or running this project, to help with Rick starting this, um, and going through that experience, he also makes uh, performances, installations, he uh, teaches, he makes drawings and shows those drawings out of a gallery, has this multidisciplinary uh, life as an artist. He's also a parent. <coughs> he's very, very generous and he's so warm. He's just loving and warm and he's a smart individual that loves to give to artists. So I, I, just, I just want to flip back, that's him right there. And if you ever have any questions for him, it might take you a few weeks to hear back from him because he's really busy, but he'll answer you back. And I think that's really good to know, too, for everybody here, that you can reach out to artists outside of your community and you'll hear back from them, especially those who are so generous, like Edgar. So another project I wanted to mention was Linda Good Bryan's Project Eats. Now she's a really important figure, if under figure, <laughs> in New York in that she started the Jam, which was the first black commercial art gal contemporary art gallery in New York in the 1970s, which of course run it also ran its course. But um, and of course it was an artist who started that because you know before there are the commercial interests, artists are the ones taking the risks and figuring out what you know, what communities need. But the project I want to talk about is Project Eats, which she started in 2008, because there's something called food deserts. I don't know in Australia how it quite works, but in places where there's particularly poverty, there's something called food deserts where people don't have access to healthy, abundant food. So she decided she was going to work with some of the housing projects in New York and create these gardens and help guide them to sort of create vegetables and other kinds of produce for their own communities as part of her practice because she really believes in interacting. And in this case, the Brooklyn Museum, when they were doing a survey of Brooklyn art a few years ago, invited her to actually create a garden like that on the grounds of the museum. And every week, they had a green market so that the community would also sort of feel welcomed. And often what happens with institutions is not everyone in the community necessarily feels welcome because they don't quite know the access points. You know, and I loved hearing about the mural program here in the city because, I mean, what a great way to sort of like have people sort of feel welcomed into the arts in a way that has very low threshold. Oh, there's some people here that are involved That's in that. Right. Oh, wonderful. I mean, I said <laughs> Um, 
Well, in her, in this case, they would actually create this green market so that the community would come out. And it also raised awareness of the fact that there was a lack of fresh produce and other markets within this area. The Brooklyn Museum might be an expensive neighborhood, but if, you're, if you don't have a lot of money around there, you realize there was a lot of lack of infrastructure. So in some ways, this project also raised awareness of that and the value of that type of thing there. Then Conflict Kitchen, I love this project. It was started mostly by designers and other art people in Pittsburgh. And they decided they were going to create a food stand. And they were only going to serve food from people, from countries that the United States was at war with. Uh -huh. <laughs> and of course, the joke being eventually this is going to be a food hall. But, so this is. Yeah, there's never enough room. Um, so, but what it did was, this was a way that, you know, to sort of take the story off, away from just the headlines of, of turmoil and death and have people sort of feel connected to a culture in a way that we can all relate to, of course, is food. And what it's also done is it's created discussion. So for instance, in one, one time they actually, here you see they did Cuban food, they've done, you know, uh, they've done Iranian food, they did Afghani food. Um, one time they also did Palestinian food. And what happened was a huge controversy emerged. Because people started the discussion going, is the United States at war with the Palestinians? Is Palestine a country? And it was amazing because it created all this discussion. And it actually was a boom for the business. <laughs> um, they had record number of people showing up because people were wondering, what does that mean? What is Palestinian food? What is, you know, what's this discussion? And often this was also a way of people to support the project in a way that you already had to, right? Meaning like everyone has to eat and this is, a, you know, you can meet your friends there and it created a really vibrant discussion. As you can see here, socially engaged art. So I think for instance, they normally had three to 400 people um, a day that would come to eat there. And just during that period, there was like six, 800 people showing up because people were really interested, because they sort of expanded their mind. Because often you don't have access to that food other ways, unless you know someone from that culture. So this was a way to create a whole discussion. Cool. OK, so before we get to this, I also want to say that um, I, I think part of the, the success or the, the keys in which uh, that we're talking about as far as what's sustainable and all the success of these projects is that it starts out with just one individual and then expands. Expands from the local right. community way, very inspiring, and you can replicate a lot of what these people have done. So on these tours, people have always asked me, can't you just tell us the keys of sustaining creative life? And I say, can't you just read the books? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just give you the cheat sheet uh, because everybody asks me this. And then I want to talk about one more thing before we Q&A. Um, so the key to sustaining creative life, no matter what, the common thread is keep your expenses so low. Like if you can be in a place where you're not spending money on all of the things that run your life. So if you can't afford to live in New York or Sydney or other places that are uh, too expensive, stay here in Tuumba. Because it's a fair, I hear it's fairly easy to live here. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. yeah. I love that. Um, persistence. So our artists that I know who thrive in their creative lives, they apply for everything that fits them. What does that mean? It means, for example, if you make a realistic figurative paintings don't apply for something that is for a grant for abstract minimal work like that doesn't fit so obviously uh, be sure to look for things that match what you do and who you are as an artist and then that means you have to do the research so I think a lot of artists don't do the research and what does that mean it just means even flipping through magazines and paying attention as to what other artists are doing and what uh, what the museums and different university galleries, whomever is showing different artists what they're doing and then follow their lead. And then also read Hyperallergic and a whole bunch of blogs that are out there that you can follow how different artists are living their lives and then follow their lives, like even look at their resumes and take notes from what they've done. Um, share, cultivate and create your own community as Tarn and Alley have. 
What's so great about their program and why I wanted to come here to be with them today is they have the ability to bring in people such as ourselves to be able to lay seeds down here in the community, cross-pollinate and meet different people here and hopefully create impact from and, and different relationships, friendships that can develop from them bringing people in. I hope that that will continue. You guys, they need money to bring people in. Okay. Um, <laughs> 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 I need to start looking at you. would not have fun to me, we would not be here today, right? So this is an opportunity for us to be able to give to a community and vice versa. We're gonna take these conversations with us out with wherever I go, wherever right. you go, back to New York. And also, this Vince is live tweeting this event. In addition to that, this whole book tour is a case study. So it will be published in two, after this tour is done, whenever that's gonna be, because I think it'll get to 99 stops, but it, like sometime in the future, like in two to three years. But then also, uh, Ray Gunn and Tuuma stays on this website for the entirety of the whole uh, tour, so that people still take notice of who you are here. So it becomes a big advertising campaign for your city and Ray Gunn. Okay, yeah. Yeah. there's a benefit. Well, generosity yields generosity, right? I mean, that's really important. I don't work with anybody who isn't generous. Um, think of the other person first, meaning that I think artists forget sometimes when they're in their studios, they just think about what's right for their work and forget that everything is a collaboration. That the, the galleries, museum um, personnel, the nonprofits, whomever that they work with, they also have a vision. And coming together with that vision is how that harmony and magic works. And I just don't believe in rejection, because I think that's too personal. I think you're rejected. I mean, I'd be so sad if your mom yells at you, or you know, or if your boyfriend or girlfriend dumps you. That's a rejection, right? But not if you don't get into something. Maybe there's a different plan for you. The universe has a different plan for you. So I think sometimes artists try to fit a square into a circle, and they can never get there, and they waste so much time doing that that they waste the opportunity to pay attention to so many other different opportunities that could be right in front of them, or they can make themselves. So uh, let's see, I forgot what was in the next slide. OK, so I think that is that. Do you want to add to that, though? I always ask you that, and you, you often say No, I think that. we should go straight to the question. OK, great. Okay. So we would like to ask people if they have some comments and question, questions for us. You should get everything out of us while we're here, for sure. And this is an act of Look, we already have a question. We have a question? Yeah. Perhaps yeah. yeah. if, if we stand up and just say where they are and who they're from. Who right. No, Jennifer. Okay. But she's like Could Jennifer. you tell me who you are? Yeah. I'm Jennifer. Um, I'm from Arts Council to Warmwell. Oh! I've been working on public art projects for 11 years now. you come here with all this information because we've tried to do this umbrella thing and it's never really worked with Arts Council but I've been stimulated so much by all your uh, ideas and there's little bits of these ideas happening because we're a refugee friendly city and for instance we have Jimmy Allpass who's doing refugee dinners but they're very small events you know they're just they haven't grown um, and I'd love to you talk about you know how you take that very small group of people, say one passionate person like Jennifer Allpass, who's doing these peace dinners with all the different refugee communities doing that. I don't know how many people know about them, but you know how do you grow that? Well, I think I think I think sometimes keeping projects small at first until they're sort of working well and a, is really key because they have to be tweaked I feel like sometimes they need to be tweaked you have to bring in maybe members of the media to maybe start maybe joining the dinners <coughs> writing about them and also you'd also don't want to overwhelmed 
And particularly with a group like refugee communities, they want to feel embraced. And so you're working kind of grassroots. I think it's really important. And then if you want to reproduce it, maybe it's about creating many small dinners at the same time on the same day to create a sense of mass. You know, like one of the types of events, um, you know, which often highlight communities in different kinds of ways. And I mean, it's essentially, if you get 100 artists opening their studios on the same day, I mean, if someone opened it one day, you know, that wouldn't make an impact. 100 artists is going to create a little bit of a mass, and it's going to create conversation, and people are all going to find something. So maybe in this case, having four or five different dinners so that people get to choose which one they will attend. And it also creates this, you know, bigger perception of maybe there are all these communities you weren't aware of. You know, and those, those you know, could create a media story that plays elsewhere may be interested in that in a way that maybe one small event wouldn't. You know, so I think sometimes coordinating many small things could be a real blessing. Um, and also, they're much more manageable, of course. Can I add to that? Yeah. So I just flip back to the slide of Area 4 or 5, because what we did for that was we purposely had a dinner of 10 tables of uh, 10 people at each dinner, uh, at eight, I'm sorry, at each table, and then one contributor from the book at each table. So there were... There actually, there were nine contributors, including myself, and then the host, which is Stuart Watson, who's just an artist who runs this uh, artist-run space, Area 405, which is not a nonprofit, so it's a fiscally sponsored space. Anyway, what we did, I think you direct the conversation too. So what we did was, I had every contributor ask each person at, at each table, what do you need? Asking the question of what artists need You'd be very surprised as what people say. And one contributor, Tim Dowd, he said he was able to answer every question. And then in addition to that, artists at that table helped that at each person. They were all satisfied in filling their needs. So in answering it and then beyond the dinner. So I think it's how you, at the dinner too, how do you direct the conversation and the content of that dinner that can go beyond that. And then what we did is we all got up on stage, we talked about those needs, and talked about the resolution and of those needs, uh, resolving those needs, and it was a five-hour event, oh, wow. the longest of the whole tour, which is incredible. And now I'm still following up with a lot of those artists in um, creating impact. And that was a Ford Foundation event. Ford Foundation event, oh. just like being here. So I'm getting a full loop. <laughs> That's another story. See, see Cher, see Cher That's another story. Cher will, yeah. You should tell that story. I know. I don't. I, I would like to answer some more questions, yeah, yeah. and then I can tell it at the end. Okay. Um, other questions. Any more, that you any might more have. questions? Oh, you must have Surely. questions for me. Surely there is. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, because I'm a researcher too, just how did, you, how did you come across the artists to put in the book and what was the brief to them? Was it oh, write, your art, write your paper about anything or here's the brief, I want you to stick to the brief or we're just going to answer the title of the book. How did, you, how did you choose it? Then how did you, did you actually ask 200 artists to provide and you actually chose the 40 or did you just specifically ask this? So there's a whole bunch of questions about how did you bring it together? First book, I was very relaxed in just getting 40 people together. Uh, most of the people I knew in that book, yep. but I learned from that book because two people out of the 40 turned out to be Debbie Downers. I don't really like people who uh, don't, who are negative, who say negative things. I mean, I, I don't care for negativity. I think you can relay truth in a positive way. So I think there, there's always room for criticism, which is better than apathy. It's information. But how it's delivered is important because that's how it's going to be heard. Yeah. How is it going to be heard? Yeah. If, it's all, if it's negative first, and it blocks people out, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in opening the door for further conversation. Yeah. So I learned from that because these two people, who I actually don't think that they realize that I haven't talked to them, really. I've, I've, I've turned the volume down to nothing on them. Um, so they are different. They're different than in the book, too, as they were on stage. So it wasn't, it wasn't 
that I learned from that. So this time I really had to vet better. Uh -huh. So I vetted in a lot of different ways. First of all, I did a ton of research. I did, I went from 400 artists to 40. I, no way, I selected them. Um, I had many conversations with a lot of them. Um, some of them were email conversations back and forth and not on the phone, but I prefer phone to hear their voice and get a sense of them. Some people were referred to by me by very, very trusted people that I know. So including Garag, but also people like Harry Philbrick introduced me to Billy and Stephen Jufala because they know me very well, mm -hmm. enough that they would know the kind of person I want to work with. Yeah. Half the people in the second book I did not know. In fact, Khaled Safsabi, he and I have had many conversations. He's already met Stephen Lambert before, he's never met Stephen before they, I got them together here in Australia. He, he's met him before me. I've never met him. I'm going to see him Monday for the first time in my life. Gina referred me to Khaled and also Pee Wee Nolden. And so for me, um, and then because she knows me 19 years, that she knows who I would get, get on with, essentially. But they had to be very good people. They had to be nice people. They had to be generous. They had to give to other artists. They had to be able to be transparent. Um, they can't be intimidated. They're fearless. Uh, they're, they're humble. Um, they're, they're loving. And a lot of them are under the radar, which was very important to me. Mm -hmm. My third book, to answer your question, is Last Artist Standing, Artist Over 50. Last Artist Standing. Mostly women. Two-thirds are women. Now, that book, I did an open call for two slots of the book. 350 people applied. I got one. So, but I have, all, I have mostly all the rest, so I'm pretty sure I do. Um, one third men, that was very easy to get. In fact, the other two thirds were, are, are difficult because women never want to relay their, uh, say their age, which I think is ridiculous. So I like women who are strong, who, are, who go forward through generations, who are powerful. We spoke about this. And so I, I think that I did that open call for that reason to be able to share the opportunities, but not for the second book. Can I just okay. Yeah, something? sorry, thank you um, for that. Just, just something to add, because I think there is a topic that comes out a lot, and one of the things that Sharon talks about generosity and sort of like being open. You know, often people always say, how can I help other artists? And you know, sometimes the way to help another artist is to get out of the way, yes. as opposed to being the one blocking what they're yes. doing. Yes. So it's like often we don't realize that it's like, you know, and there's like a saying, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Hurl another saying you've probably never heard me say. Yeah. But you know, it's like, you know, the art, the poet next door, the artist next door is, is nobody, but the artist in history is someone. And it's just like sometimes acknowledging that the artist living next door is someone too. Yeah. You know, and so it's just like understanding that and sort of trying to support whatever it is they're doing. And it doesn't, you don't have to agree with everything. It's just don't be the yeah. person, you know, sort yeah. of saying, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, when we started Hyperallergic, everyone told us we couldn't. It. They were like, you can't create a platform that also pays contributors and makes money. And da, 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 da. Everyone said that. And you know what? And we just sort of ignored it. And then we did it. Yay! So artists are the exact same. Yeah. First of all, you should put that in your essay. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, I worked for the NEA last year and I worked for Creative Capital and the Joe Mitchell Foundation. I partnered with a lot of nonprofits and I'm always pushing them back to change the vernacular because language is really important. Yes. So when you change the vernacular, it then becomes artists are more inclusive, that we live a holistic life. Mm -hmm. um, we get to choose what we want to, want to do. But back to your, your question, mm -hmm. I don't think, and I think Karag believes the same, that there are any divisions in the art world, nor do I feel that um, the, the power structure, I think, is overrated. Like, we have a lot of power as artists. We don't have any less power than, let's say, the, um, a museum professional, nonprofit person, uh, a critic, a writer, etc. We have our own power, too. But we're also, we have a power as citizens, as active citizens, that we have very big voices to contribute. We could do a lot further to, we could do a lot to grow our mission further by being more active citizens. But I do believe in whatever you choose and however you live your life, you're, you're still an artist by, by how you produce. Like, I don't make work a lot in my studio. I make work on the run a lot. Does that make me any less of an artist? I want to get away from the Vincent Van Gogh idea of who an artist is today. I don't even believe that that, that exists anymore. I mean, he's been dead for a long time. So is Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, all these artists are dead. These white men are dead. Sorry, dude. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, yeah, the classic white artists. The classic white artists. You know, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of art history too has to be changed in the way that, art history has to be changed in the way that what's being shared too, and we have a lot to say about that. So I think that all of these things are important to to um, show what the value of creativity is, but who we are as artists today. <laughs> yeah. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you were you were saying earlier that the um, the model in in America is the philanthropy model. Well, no, I wouldn't. I would say that's not the model. Oh no, not the model, but it's more accessible than it yes. is in Australia. Yeah. As far as I know, I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong. No, it's, well, it's very different here. But in your time here, what have you seen as the most? Um, as the most uh, powerful contrib contribution, you know, between is it business to artist, is it community to artist, is it artist to artist, like what is generating um, an income, you know, what is moving the dollar in an Australian market? That's a great question. Well, I mean, I think with some of the models we've been seeing in Sydney, there was Carriage Works, which was a huge, um, you know, where they also, <coughs> they do a lot of exhibitions, but they also are open, now they're opening a Cinematheque, they're all, they have a great cafe, restaurant, they're understanding that often art spaces can't just be one thing. They have to, they have to do a farmer's market, they, they also, you know, rent out the space for various things. So they understand that they have this beautiful, gorgeous space. If you haven't been there, I mean, we were there the other day. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, you know, what they call world-class, like, definite venue. But they also understand that art is one part of a much bigger conversation. You know, and if you can be the hub for that conversation, then everyone is going to benefit. I, I, in the sad part about um, this trip for me is I haven't had enough time, so I, I learned from that. I mean, the last time I was here nine years ago, I had three weeks, and I should have stuck to that plan, but I'm going to come back for sure. I, have to, I always say that I, I always leave something here that I have to take back with me, so I, I, have, to, I have to come back again. But Brianna at, at NAVA, and then also Gina and many other people that Gina has pointed me to have, have given me a lot of research in the last year about what your country has been doing in regard to the arts. I understand about Front Yard and then other artists run places like Ray Gun are coming up more and more. Um, but I do think that when those funding, uh, that funding happened, there was a big lull in depression. I, I, I believe that that was, somebody had mentioned that to me and that artists are finally coming out of that. and and changing how they see things and how they operate in society here. Um, I haven't talked to anybody in philanthropy here, although we did before we came here, um, but I know that it's much smaller in, uh, the, uh, in the U.S. I think to generate philanthropy here, mm -hmm. artists really have to be leaders in exposing themselves more outside of the norms, like outside of the gallery system, and to be able to create projects, to create followings, to create individual support. 
um, to cultivate a bigger community of people who may not have um, been interested or understood what artists have done. I think a big part of just worldwide, the problem is that artists have stayed in white walls like the gallery system and isolated themselves and yet they complain they don't have a lot of integration but we haven't, we've been sticking ourselves in isolation. So how can we expect to have any integration, right? So it has to come both ways. It has to be that we have to get out more, right? Out into the public realm more, and then to be able to inform a public as far as what our assets are to contribute into the public realm. Can I just add one more thing? And I think maybe getting a little away from the, uh, I think artists have this very, I think, false notion that any kind of money that comes to them is just charity. You know, and I think what, when I say that is because when we created our publication, one of the things that people are like, well, wouldn't people just support you? And it's like, no, people support you when there is a benefit. And I don't necessarily mean there has to be a one by one, but they don't just sort of give money to something ran blindly because they don't, you know, they think that artists need to be supported. You have to, so often artists have to be very critical that you have to figure out what your project is and how you can get it supported. And sometimes the right fit is maybe a corporation approaching them. Sometimes it's the community, and they would support it because it's a project that might benefit them locally. You know, and so thinking that way critically, and not just feeling like there's one solution for funding and one solution for for making something possible. Any other questions? Any other questions? Anyone got some? I just questions? to touch on that about yeah. the money side of it. My accountant, when I just get my tax done, he always says to me, because you love what you do, you don't charge enough, or you're not claiming enough. You oh, do yeah. all of this honestly, but don't underestimate what you do just because you love it. That's right. That's right. So, and I thought, you know, he has to, re he reminds me every time. <clears throat> I mean, I love working with professionals. You know what I mean? It just changes when people have the resources they need to make their visions possible. And I think people often don't ask for the resources, and then you wonder why you can't achieve what you're going to do. At least be honest with yourself. What are the, what is the ideal resources? You can decide later whether that you can do it regardless. That's your decision. But be honest from the beginning so that you know. So, and then when you're negotiating with someone, figure out what you need and just tell them. If they can't offer it to you, then you can make that decision. But don't feel like you're just going to get whatever scraps they're going to give you. Because you are a professional. You have something to contribute to the world. And also, and also I think it's important to not limit your definition of resource to financial. Mm -hmm. We need to use our creative skills to think about what potential resources are as well. I think social capital. Oh, we're not, we're, we're not just, uh, repeating the questions. I think for the recording, we forgot to do that. So, do you mind repeating that? <laughs> yeah. I think social capital is really important. So, I think social capital. Um, so, the question was not to, or the comment was not to forget that it's not just financial. Social capital is really important and valuable too. Um, but also, I, I just want to mention wage. If any, everyone wants, wants to write this down, it's wageforwork.com. It's an organization, a nonprofit organization, wageforwork.com, that's based out of New York that was started by artists. They create fee calculators for artists. Uh, they have a fee calculator for artists to look at to, as a gauge to ask for how much that they should charge for an event, let's say, or a speech in Australia. Oh, no, I, oh, I totally remember that, yeah. Didn't they just start that? They just started that? Yeah. Yeah. 20 years. 20 years, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things about Wage that they discovered, I think, and this is one of the important of things like Nava are, is they do the research. And research is important. And what Wage discovered that is kind of counterintuitive, but ended up they were able to prove with the research, is the wealthier an organization is, the less artist needs they pay. Mm -hmm. And that's very true. It's actually, the, so, so really it's the small organizations that are the real lifeblood for artists that are emerging. And you'd think that wouldn't be the case, but it is because those large organizations almost may want you to feel like you're lucky just to be in their yeah. presence. Yeah. And, and you know what? That's Same not true. Not. They're lucky that you're there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so just if we all sort of band together, that can change too. Yeah, if you hear that, call me. <laughs> because, because this is a case study, there are people
people who have said no to me on this, which is fine if this is not their cup of tea. There's only been three organizations, but one of them said we never pay artists. I said, <gasps> I said really? I'm, I can't wait to share that with many people. <laughs> so that, that will definitely happen. I told them that. I mean, to me also, I'm not afraid of making things public. And I think a lot of artists are. We're always afraid of if something goes wrong, or some we're not being paid. That if we expose that, then we're not going. We're going to be uh, hurt. But in my lifetime, I've sued uh, a university and I've sued a corporation. I won both of them. And so in my life, I'm not afraid of that. Even though my mother told me it's going to hurt you, it's going to hurt your reputation. I don't. I didn't have a reputation, but it didn't. It didn't hurt me at all. So I think that if artists start policing and getting things out, rather than because if you don't say anything, it just stays normal, and people get away with things. And you have to be able to share things and share things with the press. Share things with the press because I think that. And if you can be, um, if you can be uh, open about it and not be anonymous, that's the best case scenario. Yes. Very good. A couple of questions. Oh yes, yeah, just adding on to what you said that now it's just being like a campaign for fair pay for artists. Right. That's what I was getting mixed up with. Right? Sure. That's awesome, Nava. Yeah, and through that campaign, we've been having meetings around right. um, Australia, meeting with um, gallery organisations, right. artists. Right. Now, one that we just had in Brisbane a couple of weeks ago it was really surprising that came out that the, the artists that attended, I mean, it's not representative, it was just a couple of artists that said, wow, I didn't even really consider, you know, the, the right for myself to get paid. Um, you know, a world rage. Mm -hmm. It's really and sad, isn't it? Just that lack of recognition of their own value um, of their actual time. Right. And also approach that issue of <coughs> when you come to a conflict, um, you need to be at a conflict with an institution or a gallery, uh, a kind of lack of understanding or resources of how to, to mediate, and, you know, being scared, you know, basically not having that support because, you know, they're scared to, to risk themselves to mediate a conflict about payment. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what NAVA's doing as well is, is collecting those resources and, and support for, for ways to mediate around those conflicts and the, also just the basic acknowledgement of your right to be paid Great. as well. That's good. And Arts Law is another organisation that can help an artist if they do find themselves in that conflict where an institution or a corporation hasn't, hasn't paid them and, and valued them accordingly. Arts Law. Mm -hmm. One more question? Yeah, uh, well there's two actually. Yes. Can we finish with two? Last two. Hi. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the presentation. I just wanted to say that I really value the, the point that you've made about um, the fact that as artists we offer a lot uh, and we have a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge that we can share. So a beautiful starting point of asking people what are your needs and how might I be able to respond to that creatively. I think that's really beautiful and something that we should all realise that, that we have so much to give. Well, thank you for, and I'll, I'll say how I, how I figured that out. This man named Ben Kasnocha, who was the personal assistant of Reid Hoffman, who's the CEO of LinkedIn. I don't know why I bring LinkedIn up. I, I don't work for them. But I, <laughs> anyway, Brett Wallace is in this book who works for LinkedIn. But anyway, it just happened to be, and he was the personal assistant of Reid Hoffman. And what he noticed was that so many people contacting Reid always just ask, and this is in business. This is not even, this is not in our world. He said, so many people were asking Reed for his time, for opportunities, for money, but the very few people, so small, asking and then coming back and saying, what may I do for you? Those were the people that Reed contacted, mm -hmm. not the others. Mm -hmm. Because it creates a conversation. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. And oftentimes, artists just do me, 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 me. I've also learned that if you ask for money, you get advice. If you ask for advice, you get money. So I think that that's really <laughs> Sorry, Write that down. I'm tweeting that out. <laughs> that works for me all the time. But anyway, I, I just think that that's, that's, thank you for saying that, because I think also as leaders in our, in society, we can be leading as just naturally good people. And we forget that the best thing is to be a good person. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, David, did you have a question? Sure. Um, yes, I'm. So, are you going to yeah. promise us, us money <laughs> for that? <laughs> that Twitter address is back up. People oh, are asking for Twitter. Go ahead. Yeah, you can always tweet us. Whoops. Other way. Sorry. Oh, no, you know, I'll start up. With yeah, go to the end. Yep. Yeah. Look, we're going through all the. <laughs> all right, what were you saying? Um, this question really is not 
yes, I am a politician, but I'm going to ask this, and she's gone now, so I can actually ask this. She wouldn't let me ask it when Who's she? my wife was here. I've spent two decades married to a performing artist. Oh. And so she... Uh, oh. Miranda, oh. What's her name? Mel. 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 So we spent um, a number of years in London, and so she's an opera singer. Oh. And when, I don't know, performing arts are a bit different to visual arts, but... No, but there's a lot in common. Just goes to that question of value. Yes. Um, in the UK, she would sing, Mel would sing, she would be paid. Um, just picking up on that comment that you made about sometimes the bigger the institution, the less likely they are to pay. I don't know how many times in Australia sure. she got told, Mel got told, uh, you do this for the experience, or this will be great for your CV. Continue to build communities. It's not a question of funding, and forget I'm a politician, but how do we, how do we build communities where the arts are, <coughs> are valued, um, and, and the projects up there are fantastic projects, but how do we continue to build um, that culture of valuing artists more, and it's probably a bigger question, the whole book's about that, I guess, but um, naming and shaming institutions that pay poorly or don't pay at all, like, I don't know whether that's a solution, or how do we, how do we change our culture? Okay, I'll tell you how we shamed the British Museum. <laughs> so the British Museum, we found a listing for, they were actually advertising for an internship that essentially was the job to, to upkeep their website. Real story. This is an institution with a hundred million dollar budget that literally wanted an intern to keep up their website. Okay. We brought it up. Let me tell you, within 24 hours, the British Museum said they will not do that anymore. And that's just an example. Sometimes it's just pointing it out. Because people, institutions are diverse. Let's not think of them as monoliths. It's not like one person, like everyone speaks with the same voice. Within institutions, there are discussions. Sometimes people lose out in those discussions, the people who want to do the right thing. So if you can empower them, they are going to have a bigger voice in those meetings. Do you know? So you say, oh, well, I told you we should be paying our interns. I told you we should pay our performers. If the community starts thinking that's inappropriate, that's going to change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge power that we, all of us in this room, have. But I also think it's about, just on the artist side, and for, for your wife, Mel, I would have said to her, and I would love to talk to her more, because I know some performing artists, and I'm, I'm going to start a... I'm about to sign a contract to be a series editor for um, Living Scene and Creative Life, um, poetry, dance, theater, um, music, and I've done some research towards, towards that as well. Um, there's a lot of common traits of all, all creative people, um, and this happens in all sectors, I think, some, more, some sectors more than others. But anyway, I was going to say that I think it's also having her in some way state that value other than just the performance itself. Like I think oftentimes visual artists are not understood as to the many values that they have. So I don't know if it means then that she doesn't then perform there but then she performs somewhere out in the public that's not a traditional um, venue that's further into community so that that value can increase. I think oftentimes the public doesn't know what our value is or isn't reminded of that. So I think that it's actually a great opportunity that she wasn't work, didn't work with those big institutions because then if we get into these more rural or smaller communities to build up the fact that the arts are important like they are in Toowoomba, that there will be more funding hopefully and there will now I'm talking as a politician, <laughs> as more funding and more accessibility if it's further into education. I'm glad that the A was added because it's just not about painting and drawing and singing. It's much bigger than that. It's about how the brain works, how it expands. And you know this because you're married to Mel. So I think that it's an opportunity for her to go elsewhere and create something else that would further the conversation. Don't mention part. Um, say again? Barter. Yeah, like, uh, oh, the, the economy, the barter economy, too. Like, to be able, not necessarily to get money from somebody, that's great. You can, you can get it, um, uh, maybe trade with somebody to, to have an opportunity. 
it's like I mean, there's a lot of also the the, the uh, self funding too. Yeah, well, it's also like let's say if an institution doesn't pay you, maybe you guarantee that, for instance, they use their email list to promote something you're doing. Right, back to the institution. You know, so this way you could negotiate with them. Maybe they allow you to use a room for something you need for right, a rehearsal right. or something. That's right. So that way it's like they, sometimes they have resources that aren't just monetary that you can take advantage of, and they would be happy to provide for you. So sometimes it's just having that conversation might be the way instead of worrying about money. I forgot about that. I do think, thank you for mentioning that, I do think it's if, if Mel had a set of needs and assets from the institution to go back to her and vice versa to create something bigger than just being paid. Okay, and I know we're running out of time, so yeah, thank we you. Are, but it's been very good. Everyone enjoyed that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is the official law. Yes, we right brought them here. from New York, New York the City, so official it's not on bookshelves here, actually. And so really, I would say really if you good. like, you should definitely. If you'd like to, I will sign them. So I, do, we, I just want to get these essays out to change a culture. That's why we did it. And uh, how much? I don't know. This is that. Uh, Seventy-five. Seventy-five dollars. Including signs. Everything. Yeah. So I have uh, uh, credit cards. Uh, chip. And then we are selling the first book as well. So thank you. No, we really appreciate it. It's been uh, it's been enlightening. It really has. I'm just a shame. Grace has just left the building, as I was going to say. Perhaps she she may well have been an artist that right. that could be in uh, could be right. in that book. It seems like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Soon, but, um, thank as far you. I'd like changing, to talk to her. As far as changing culture for our city, yeah. uh, I think you'll all agree that we wouldn't have some of the developments we've got now as far as Walton stores, which I hope you get to have a look at. Uh, Bell Street Mall, for instance, over the next, well, today and yesterday, we've had a, an installation of various things, and Jennifer was down there last night, I ran into, we're trying to hula hoop actually last night. We can do that from this afternoon, four o'clock, there's a trial. So we are doing those sorts of things, but I'm really interested to have a further chat with you around the, the embedding someone with, uh, you know, arts within a council uh, that can Provide that different Oh, thing. absolutely. No, That's yeah. very important. Very important what you just said. Calm down. Calm yes. down. <laughs> 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 about, because what, what I pick creative, creative people are underutilised. In engineering problems can be solved by creative people thinking differently. We've had for many years, and I hate to say it, a car parking issue in Toowoomba, in the CBD. And I would love to think that creative minds could get together and actually think of different ways that you could do that. Now we've got two and a half thousand car parks across here, it's not as pressing at the moment, but they're the sort of engineering issues. Here's Grace now, we've just, I've just nominated you. Grace, you're in the next book. Uh, but no, seriously, she is, um, Grace is, and shame you're not here on the 20th of May actually, because that's when First Gate Festival will be, but now that uh, we'll link up, you'll be able to I'd see some to see footage it, and, and what have you, which would be great. Uh, that's not downplaying all the other creative people in this room and those that could be here today. We are, I think, a creative city and a creative region. And it's largely because of, of the wonderful people we have in this room and those that contribute outside. But it's even better now because we're now on the stage of New York. Thank you, Tisha. Yeah, thank you. We'll give you this recording too, for sure. You'll have this recording. So the people who couldn't see it, we better see it. But what you said was really important because if artists were on community boards, if they also um, ran for office, if they were more active citizens, things would definitely change. Artists. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. That's an invitation from you. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it has been extra special. There are some, there's some beautiful food awaiting for us uh, in the room, unless Elizabeth and Charlotte have eaten it all. I think they've made most of it up. They've stood all, they were in there. We saw them nibbling away. Um, but also, can I partic so particularly thank Etiquette 24-7, uh, and also Andrew from Salt Studios, who's been doing the photographic <laughs> Just to conclude, can I uh, invite um, Vincent and Vegan to come forward oh. as we present officially a Dwarf of Violet pin. Oh. 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 Oh.
All the best, everyone. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the week.